Hello and welcome. In this video I will be speaking about an element of early Muslim understanding of our universe. This video will look at the Islamic myth of creation and the role of the giant whale that carries the earth on its back. Yes, you heard that right, the giant whale that carries the earth on its back. But before I get into that, I'd like to mention something that comes up when debating Muslims in particular. When I'm speaking to them about their religion and highlighting errors in scripture, I often hear Muslims say this to me. Talk to a scholar. Now I wonder if Muslims themselves ever bother speaking to scholars of other religions before dismissing them all. And some Muslims will even go further and demand you learn fluent classical Arabic and only then you can judge Islam fairly. Well again, do they make the effort to learn all the other foreign languages, to read other scriptures in their original form before dismissing them? I somehow doubt it. So anyway, I want to see where we can get by talking to scholars. Just who are the best scholars to ask? Muslims today live 1400 years after Muhammad, so they in this day and age obviously cannot tell us what was meant by the Quranic verses, and whether particular hadiths are true or not. In fact, all modern scholars will depend on Muslim scholars in the past, who have dedicated their entire lives to understanding the religion. The Quran claims to be clear and generally speaking it is. But there are plenty of verses which aren't universally agreed upon by the experts who analyze those verses. This is where the Mufassirin or exegetes come in. They often devote their entire lives to understanding Islam and the Quran, in order to make it clear for other Muslims what the verses are supposed to mean. So who better to tell us what Islam is really about than these people who have dedicated their entire lives to this religion? There are over a hundred tafsirs available for Muslims to read from and not two are the same. Several tafsirs are regarded more highly than others. The top two for mainstream Sunni Islam are probably the tafsirs of Ibn Kathir and Tabari. This is why I use those two in particular when looking at the interpretation of verses. Others like Kortobi and Jalalain are also quite reputable. But don't take my word for it, let's listen to some Muslim clerics and prominent Islamists and hear their opinion on which tafsirs are the best. The tafsir is something different. It quotes the meanings of the verse in details according to another Quranic verse or according to the hadith, derived from uh, huge references such as Ibn Kathir, Al-Tabari, Al-Qurtubi and the great scholars of the interpreters of the Quran. In English, now there is a fantastic book, 10 volumes available, the abridged tafsir of Ibn Kathir. And the publisher is Dar es Salaam publication. I highly recommend for every Muslim to have this book at home. As far as Arabic tafsirs are concerned, there are many tafsirs in Arabic. The two most well known amongst all the Arabic tafsirs is of Tabri and the other is Ibn Qasir. There are many other tafsirs, for example, Qurtubi, then Zamak Shadi Kashaf, and various others. But the two most famous are Tabri and Ibn Qasir. According to Ibn Khuzayma, he says that he has read the book from the start to the end. And he does not know of any person more knowledgeable than Ibn Jarir in the full world as far as knowledge of the Quran is concerned. There are many comments by many various scholars on the commentary of At-Tabri. Another famous person, Sheikh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, regarding this commentary, he says that amongst the commentaries available now, at his time he's talking, amongst the commentaries available at his time, the best commentary is of Ibn Jarir, than At-Tabri. Because he gives the views of the Salafs, of the predecessors, the Salaf is following. And he also quotes from authentic Sanad. The Sanad is authentic. He does not quote sources which are dubious, which are doubtful. Neither does he quote Bidah, that is innovation. That is the reason Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah preferred his commentary the best. 
So these two commentaries, At-Tabri and Ibn Kasir, are the best. In short, as far as these two best commentaries are concerned, At-Tabri is more famous and better, but it's specially for the scholars and the seekers of knowledge. It may not be good for a layman or ordinary person, but as far as Ibn Kasir is concerned, it's good for the scholar as well as the seeker of knowledge as well as for ordinary Muslim. These two communities in Arabic are the two best one according to my knowledge. So back to the topic of the video. I want to look at the interpretation of Islam biggest scholars regarding the first verse of Surah 68, the chapter of the pen. Now just to be clear, the verse in question reads this. Noon, which is an Arabic letter. Noon by the pen and that which they write. As we can see, the verse itself doesn't tell us much. What is meant by the letter Noon? This is where the scholars have come in, to tell us their opinion on the matter based on the early narrations. Now let's begin with Ibn Kathir. He states this in his tafsir. He is quoting Tabari, the other great Mufassir, who is quoting Abdullah ibn Abbas, Muhammad's cousin and a widely respected authority on Islam and the Quran. The first thing Allah created was the pen. He ordered it to write... It said, what shall I write? He said, write the fate of everything. So it wrote what will happen from the day until the day of judgment. Then he created the noon, which is the will. Then he raised the water and created the heavens with it. And laid the earth on the back of the noon. The noon moved and so did the earth. So it was fixed down with mountains. So let's recap here for a minute. Allah makes a talking pen has a conversation with his pen, the pen writes everything that's ever going to happen, then Allah creates a big fat wheel and then lifts the water at ground level up to create the sky. That's probably because they saw a blue sky and thought it was water floating above us. An idea that seems supported by this verse, Surah 11 verse 7. Then the flat earth is placed on the wheel's back, The wheel doesn't like this heavy thing on it, so it tries to shake off the earth above it. But being a smart god, he decides to fix the earth in its place with mountains. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of creation. Now you may be thinking, Ibn Kathir's tafsir is available in English. So why did I show you the Arabic version when this is an English video? Well, this tafsir has been translated into English... But for some mysterious reason, the dishonest translators chose not to translate what he says about this verse in the English translation. Like, maybe they have something to hide from you. If we go to the tafsir of Ibn Abbas, it has been translated honestly. They haven't left this out, so let's read. And from his narration on the authority of Ibn Abbas that he said, regarding the interpretation of Allah's saying, Noon, he says, Allah swears by the noon, which is the will that carries the earth on its back while in water. Notice here it says earth, which means plural, which is seven earths. And beneath, which is the bull, and under the bull is the rock, and under the rock is the dust. And no one knows what is under the dust, save Allah. Notice in this variation it refers to earth in the plural form, earth. This is because of this verse in the Quran, Surah 65 verse 12. This story and many of its variations primarily originates from Abdullah ibn Abbas, Muhammad's cousin and one of his loyal followers who has respect among Sunni and Shia Muslims. Now the major tafsirs from mainstream Sunni Muslims, according to the clerics we heard earlier in the video, and according to this great tafsir website, are the following. We find this story of the will and the earth being laid on its back in seven out of the eight of these major tafsirs. And one of these was even written as late as the year 1835, and still talks about this great will carrying the earth on its back. Incidentally, all those major tafsirs who mention it do not discredit the story as false in any way. 
The only tafsir from the major ones that does not include a variation of this will story is tafsir al Jalalain, which is generally regarded as a summarized tafsir, which may be a reason why he didn't mention this story. But regardless, al Jalalain understood the earth to be flat, And so we see yet another great Muslim scholar who didn't understand the reality of our universe based on his reading of Islamic text. The writers of this tafsir explicitly say in their interpretation of verse 20 in chapter 88, where they say, as for his words, Sutihat laid out flat, this on a literal reading suggests that the earth is flat which is the opinion of most of the scholars of the revealed law and not as fair as astronomers have it. Notice how he tells the earth being flat is the opinion of most of the scholars of the law. If you actually look at the Arabic version of this tafsir, it doesn't even say most there. He just says this is the opinion of Muslim scholars. As always, you can find the sources for everything mentioned in this video in the description box. Now, my Muslim critics will undoubtedly not be happy with the facts presented and throw some arguments my way. So let me try to preempt them briefly. First of all, these hadiths are not authentic. That is simply wrong. While there are plenty of variations for this hadith and some of which are classified as weak, There are a number of other variations which are fully authentic. This one reads as follows. Ibn Abbas says, The first thing that Allah created was the pen. He told it to write, so it wrote everything that will happen until the final hour arrives. Then he created the noon, the will, above the water. Then he placed the earth on it. Some other variations are also confirmed as authentic and in line with the methodology used by Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim by a scholar who used to classify hadiths called Al-Hakim in his book called Al-Mustadrak. These are referenced on this page by Islam Q&A, which tries to wiggle out of the problem but does not deny it has been classified as authentic. Also, I've said earlier, none of the tafsirs I showed doubt the authenticity of this story in their tafsirs. Well, who cares what Ibn Abbas said? It's just his opinion. I wouldn't say that. Muslims hold Ibn Abbas as the very credible authority on the Quran's interpretation. So Allah says, O oh Muhammad sallam, asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh Allah, give this young boy a deep understanding of the deen and grant him knowledge of the interpretation of the revelation, which means tafsir of the Quran. And truly, later on, This Abdullah ibn Abbas was known as Habrul Ummati wa Turjumanul Quran. He was known as the jurist of the Ummah, the one who had the most knowledge and jurisprudence of the whole Ummah. And he was known as Turjumanul Quran, which means the one who had the deepest knowledge of tafsir and the revelation and why verses were revealed and what they meant. Let me just quote him again. He was known as the one with the deepest knowledge of tafsir and revelation and why verses were revealed and what they meant. There are several narrations that show us that Muhammad himself held Abdullah ibn Abbas and his knowledge in high regard. Here is one. The Messenger of Allah embraced me and said, O oh Allah, teach him wisdom and the correct interpretation of the book. I want to add one more thing before I end this video. All the sources so far have been from Sunni authorities and texts. So a Shia watching this is probably smiling and laughing along with us at how ridiculous the Sunnis can be with all this whale nonsense. So in the interest of balance, here is an hadith of the most reputable Shia source that quotes Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, one of Muhammad's infallible descendants according to Shia doctrine as saying the following. The will which is carrying the earth secretly said to itself that it's carrying the earth by its own strength. So Allah the High sent to it a fish smaller than a palm's length and larger than a finger. So it entered in its gills and shocked it. It remained like that for 40 days. Then Allah raised it and was merciful to it and took it out. So whenever Allah intends the earth to be in a quake, he sends that small fish to that big fish So when he sees it, it becomes restless, so the earth gets engulfed by the earthquake. 
There is another hadith about this will in the Shia hadith, also by the same imam, but Shias will no doubt tell us that this hadith, which is trying to explain how earthquakes happen, is not authentic. And to a degree, they don't actually hold hadiths as sacrosanct, like many Sunnis do with Bukhari and Muslim. But nevertheless, we can see very clearly that this myth of the earth laying on the back of a giant wheel is not isolated. It's found in numerous places in both Sunni and Shia Islam. It's found in many credible Islamic texts and sourced to companions like Abdullah ibn Abbas, who was largely recognized as an expert on what the Quran means. We also found a few authentic narrations to back this up. The word Nun, which could be understood as a letter, is also used to refer to a will in chapter 21, verse 87, where Prophet Jonah, Yunus in Arabic, is called the Nun because he was swallowed in the story by a will. So it appears very plausible for the meaning behind this verse was indeed referred to this very large whale that carries the earth on its back. Now just to be clear, despite the evidence I just laid out as to why this whale story could in fact be the actual meaning for the verse I cited, my argument is not, and I repeat, not that the Quran clearly mentions this story of the great whale, because we only find it clearly stated in interpretations and hadiths and not through a literal reading. My argument is as follows. If the Quran is completely perfect, and is best understood, perhaps only understood, by scholars who dedicated their lives to understanding its content, then why did many highly credible Muslim scholars speak about this giant wheel that carries the earth on its back? Surely, if the Quran spoke clearly about the true realities of our world, These top scholars wouldn't have given this whale story any credibility whatsoever. If the best Islamic scholars were that wrong, then why ask me to speak to today Islamic scholars? Who are only basing their understanding on what previous Islamic scholars have said. Will I be getting the original understanding of Islam? Or will it be heavenly reinterpreted because of the influence of today's social norms and modern scientific understanding? How can we trust their interpretation for any other verse for that matter? If they were all so wrong on this verse and pretty much in agreement on their mistake, how do we know that they understood any other verses correctly? If people who dedicated their entire lives to understanding Islam and the Quran can reach such poor conclusions despite their great dedication? Well, what hope does that give us that we can understand it any better? Thank you for watching. Share this video far and wide. And until next time, goodbye.